you very much, uh, everyone. And um, this afternoon, uh, it's afternoon in South Africa. I'm going to be uh, presenting to you um, on the study that we've been doing on antiretroviral treatment of acute HIV infection. And I'm going to discuss uh, this in the in relevant or in the context of a functional cure for HIV. So thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to just thank uh, Dr. Fish for inviting me to give this talk. So the outline of my talk would be, first of all, I would like to discuss why we should uh, do HIV yeah. research, despite the fact that we have uh, improved prevention and treatment uh, strategies. As uh, everyone in the audience uh, probably knows, we have uh, very good tools at the moment for prevention of uh, HIV infection. Uh, this includes uh, the usual uh, ABC strategies, abstinence, uh, being faithful, the use of condoms, uh, as well as uh, other interventions such as uh, medical male circumcision, all of which have been shown to uh, dramatically reduce uh, the risk of HIV acquisition. Unfortunately, None of these prevention strategies work 100%, and therefore we, have, we still have a very long way to go uh, before we, are, we can actually um, you know, put a significant dent in the number of cases of HIV that are experienced uh, worldwide every year. I'll come back to uh, treatment strategies in, in my next slide. So I, I will be discussing a uh, a study that we've been doing here in South Africa called the Fresh Cohort, uh, Fresh Stance for Females, Rise to Education, Support and Health, which is a unique cohort to address the gap in HIV prevention, pathogenesis, and cure research. And then I'll discuss the impact of treatment of hyperacute HIV infection. I'll define that term uh, as we go along on virologic and immunologic factors in HIV infection. And then I'll finish by discussing the implications uh, of this study and other similar studies for HIV cure research, particularly in resource-limited resource settings. So although we have very powerful antiretroviral drugs that uh, have uh, you know, made people who are HIV infected to be able to live long health lives, we all know that uh, these antiretroviral drugs are not really the answer, the ultimate answer to this particular problem. We know that people who are HIV infected of uh, lower probability of survival, and this uh, slide is showing some data from a Danish cohort. So this is a resource-rich setting, where, as you can see, compared to population control, people on antiretroviral drugs, uh, their probability of survival to the age of 70 is cut by almost 50%. Uh, and this is in a resource-rich uh, uh, setting. So you can imagine that the numbers would be even worse uh, in a, in a resource-limited uh, setting, such as in South Africa uh, and other countries that are very uh, severely affected by the HIV epidemic. Uh, data also from various studies shows that there is significant morbidity that persists on antiretroviral therapy, uh, despite successful treatment of the infection. So people who have HIV infection, despite being on antiretroviral drugs, that the fully suppressive virus, have higher risk, higher risk of cardiovascular diseases, metabolic disorders, neurocognitive abnormalities, uh, liver disease, renal disease, bone disorders, malignancies, as well as uh, general frailty. And this data uh, in this particular case uh, from uh, resource rich countries, but this is even worse uh, uh, as antiretroviral drugs are rolled out in resource limited settings. So despite uh, successful uh, treatment of uh, HIV using antiretroviral drugs, unfortunately, these drugs are not able to achieve a cure of HIV infection, and there are various barriers to a cure. So as you can see from this graph, when somebody is HIV infected, they have viral load, and once they start antiretroviral therapy, the antiretroviral therapy is able to bring down the viral load to undetectable levels. Um, but as soon as somebody comes off antiretroviral drugs and stops taking antiretroviral drugs, the virus comes back up uh, almost to the normal, uh, to, the, to the levels before 
before the person went on and took a drug. And there are various barriers that have been described that uh, limit a cure or that have made uh, an HIV cure by antiretroviral drugs uh, difficult. And this includes the presence of latently infected CDH T cells. These are long lived cells that circulate in the body. Uh, and uh, despite many years of suppression, these uh, latently infected cells can become activated at some point uh, when somebody is off antiretroviral drugs. And this leads to rebound of viremia once uh, antiretroviral therapy is, uh, uh, is stopped. Antiretroviral drugs also uh, actually incompletely suppress the virus. So there is ongoing, uh, and some researchers have argued there is ongoing uh, virus replication. Even in the face of antiretroviral therapy, it is only that we cannot detect the amount of virus because it is uh, circulating at very, very low levels. And then, of course, we have the problem of anatomical reservoirs that have illustrated here, where the virus can persist in certain areas or certain anatomical regions in the body, such as the central nervous system, the, the gut, as well as the reproductive system. And in this uh, anatomical reservoirs, the antiretroviral drugs sometimes do not penetrate to the full extent these anatomical reservoirs, allowing the virus to continue to replicate at low levels in these anatomical reservoirs. So because of these three reasons that are listed in the slide, uh, antiretroviral therapy unfortunately does not uh, cure HIV infection. So despite these uh, difficulties, there are strategies that have been proposed for an uh, HIV cure. Uh, the first strategy that has been proposed is to eliminate these latently uh, infected cells. And this can be achieved by ablative uh, chemotherapy. Uh, shock and cure strategies, uh, as was recently reviewed in a paper in the Journal of Clinical Investigation by uh, Siliciano. Uh, people have also been able to engineer cells that become refractory to HIV infection. So we know that HIV, for example, uses specific uh, core receptors such as the CCR5 to enter cells. And one can engineer cells that become refractory using uh, the gene editing uh, technologies have, that have become uh, recently available. Unfortunately, uh, the translation of uh, a lot of this technology into clinical pra practice is currently at the very early stages. So this has not yet been translated into, into clinical effectiveness. So that uh, proposal for curing HIV, or at least uh, achieving a functional cure, is to optimize a combination of antiretroviral therapy. And the strategies that have been proposed include early treatment of acute HIV infection. So if you treat uh, people very, very early, you may be able to achieve a functional cure where somebody can come off antiretroviral drugs and stay off antiretroviral drugs for a, for a long period of time. And this was uh, demonstrated very well in the so-called Mississippi baby, where they, uh, a child was uh, given antiretroviral uh, therapy within 30 hours of being born. And then this uh, particular child was lost in follow-up. And when they came back, they were found to be uh, not HIV infected. Unfortunately, this baby, eventually, uh, the virus rebounded. And the, and, the, and the baby had to be put back on antiretroviral therapy. And then there are a number of other studies, recent studies. Uh, one in particular uh, called the Visconti done in France, where individuals were treated during acute HIV infection. And uh, when they these individuals, uh, for whatever reason, interrupted antiretroviral therapy. They were found to be able to control the virus without, uh, or at least a percentage of these individuals, 15% of them, were found to be able to control the virus without uh, antiretroviral, antiretroviral therapy. We don't yet know the mechanisms that allow these individuals, these rare individuals, to control the virus without antiretroviral therapy for a long period of time. But this is clearly a, a very active area of research and it is one that we think that we can use particularly for our setting which is a uh, resource limited setting where we have a high incidence of HIV infection and and, uh, and may be able to identify individuals with acute HIV infection. So this is a strategy that we ourselves have attempted or, uh, here in Durban and South Africa and I'm going to describe to you um, a study called the Fresh uh, Core Study that we have initiated. So what we do is we identify individuals with acute HIV infection, 
And as you all know, when somebody is uh, infected with HIV, first infected with HIV, there is this burst of virus replication where the virus replicates um, to very high level. And then the immune system, if they are not taking antiviral drugs, the immune system is able to control the virus to what we call a viral load set point. And a lot of studies on the viral load set point is a good predictor of the rate of CD4 decline and, and of time to, uh, to see the rate. So the question that we have asked ourselves here in Durban, South Africa, is can we identify individuals with hyperacute HIV infection? And by hyperacute HIV infection, I mean people that have uh, recently become infected with HIV before they, they reach peak viremia. Can we identify people very, very early during acute uh, HIV infection? And what will be the impact of early treatment on immune responses as well as the viral reservoir? What we have attempted to do is to identify, as I said, people with uh, acute HIV infection. And as you can imagine, this is not uh, an easy task because uh, obviously we don't know when somebody gets uh, infected. And by the time the most patients come in to the clinic, they are already very, very sick and they are experiencing a retroviral syndrome. It means that most likely they are at peak viremia or past peak viremia. All these individuals have already converted and have started developing uh, anti-HIV antibodies already. So in order to overcome this uh, particular problem of identifying people during very, very early stages of HIV infection, particularly during CB stages 1 and 2, when they have not yet developed antibodies against HIV, what we have done is to design a particular cohort that we call uh, the fresh cohort. And uh, like I said, FRESH stands for Females Rising Through Education, Support and Health. What we do is that we recruit women who are between the ages of 18 to 23. And the reason we recruit women between the ages of 18 and 23 is that we know that women in South Africa in this age are at very high risk of HIV infection. And we know that from many epidemiological studies that have been done in the past. We then provide an, an intensive and program where the women come to our clinic twice a week. And during this time when they come into the clinic, we provide them with life skills and job readiness curriculum that coincides with the sample collection. And when we collect this sample, we use this sample to test for HIV RNA. So during this time, the individuals are HIV negative, and then we test them twice a week. And if somebody seroconverts, we are able to, or if somebody develops uh, viremia in their blood, we are able to detect it very quickly within two days of our previous HIV negative test. So we identify persons in the earliest stages of acute HIV infection by testing them twice a week for one year. And then we are able to collect samples before they become infected, uh, during the acute phase of infection, and post that uh, HIV infection stage. And we are also able to study antiviral immune responses as they develop in the people that become HIV infected. So this is the set, set up study. Uh, like I said, we do a twice weekly HIV RNA testing by finger prick blood draws. We also are able to collect uh, quarterly blood and mucosal sampling of the female genital tract from these individuals even before they become infected because we are following them for one, for, for one year. Uh, if they don't become infected within one year, they then uh, transition out of the study. But if somebody uh, unfortunately becomes HIV, infected during the course of the study, we then enroll them into the phase two of the study, which is the acute infection phase of the study, and we are able then to collect uh, samples uh, at various uh, stages during the earliest phases of HIV infection, and are able to follow these individuals over a long period of time. More recently, we have obtained ethical approval to collect uh, lymph node samples from these uh, particular individuals. So once somebody gets infected, we can consent them to obtain a lymph node acquisition uh, sample um, that allows us to do detailed immunological studies in mucosal, in mucosal tissue. So up to June 30, 2016, we had identified for the two acute HIV infections. And what I'm showing you here uh, is the time to HIV infection for the various individuals that we followed in this uh, particular study. So you can see, for example, uh, uh, from the bottom up, uh, this last individual, we follow them for that one day, 
in the study and then we were able to identify them with HIV RNA and then uh, uh, they moved into phase two of the study. So by June 30, we had identified 42 acute HIV infections. The, the first 14 individuals, we did not treat them. And the reason we did not treat is because we were following the South African guidelines for treatment of HIV infection, which at the time called for the treatment of people with the acute with the HIV infection when their CD4 count fell below uh, CD50, uh, CD4 T cells. But uh, once we started identifying individuals with acute HIV infection, and once we confirmed that in fact we were identifying these individuals very, very early, even before peak virus, we decided that we, for ethical reasons, we must start treating these individuals. And so uh, the subsequent 28 individuals that we identified in this particular cohort, we were able to, to treat them. And most of them we treated them during TB1. We initiated treatment during TB1 stage of HIV infection. And the incidence, as you can see uh, in this graph, was 8.5, uh, which is very, very high uh, incidence rate for 100 uh, per year in this particular cohort. So in this particular slide, then, I'm showing you the first acute HIV infection that we identified. As you can see, this person was HIV negative by RNA-PCR. And then suddenly, we were able to identify them with acute HIV infection. And then as we followed them, in subsequent time points, we could see the viral load going up, and then come, uh, then and then the viral load comes down as is typical with acute HIV infection. In contrast, the CD4 count dropped precipitously during the acute phase of HIV infection. Again, this is the first acute HIV infection that we identified, and this person was not treated with, with antiretroviral drugs. On the right hand side, you can see a patient with acute HIV infection that we treated immediately following detection of viremia. And you can see by treating this particular individual, we're able to blunt uh, peak viremia, such that it doesn't go up as high as the person that is untreated. And we are also able to uh, preserve the CD4 cell count in this particular individual because we treated them very, very early during the uh, PB1 stage of infection. The next slide shows summarized data for uh, all the, the participants that we identified with PB1 acute HIV infection. Uh, that is when they are RNA positive, antibody negative, and you're able to start them on treatment immediately within a day. And as you can see, uh, the untreated, uh, by treating acute HIV infection, you're able to blunt uh, peak viremia in this particular individual when compared to the patients that were not treated. If anyone looks at CD4 cell count, the nadir CD4 count in these individuals, you can see again that you're able to preserve uh, CD4 cell count in the, in the treated participants compared to the uh, participants that were not treated. So the participants who were not treated had a precipitous drop in the CD4 cell count, whereas the treated participants preserved the CD4, uh, uh, CD4 cell count, suggesting that this uh, individual, that uh, clearly uh, added treatment preserved uh, the immune system. One of the questions that we have asked in this cohort is uh, what happens to immune responses in these uh, individuals when you follow them over time. And I show you here data showing uh, the participants that we treated with CD1 uh, during the CD1 stage of uh, infection. And you can see that most of these individuals do not still convert. So the blue dot show Western blood tests that we did over time. And the blue dots show that it was a negative Western blot uh, result. So you can see that over, over up to uh, 100 days post-infection, and uh, we have now more recent data where we have extended the testing of these individuals to one year post-infection, you can see that most of these individuals do not still convert. We have a few individuals that are still converted, like uh, participant 683 here. But it turns out that this particular individual was actually past the peak viremia when we identified them. And uh, by that time, they, they had already zero converted and they remained zero positive uh, on this Western blood assays uh, in subsequent uh, tests. So the other uh, issue that we have examined these participants is whether they make HIV-specific CD8 T cell immune responses. We know that HIV-specific CD8 T cell responses are important in controlling viremia. And so we have asked whether these individuals are able to make HIV-specific CD8 T cell uh, immune responses. 
And as you can see for this particular patient, this is a patient that we identified and treated very, very early. The person does not seroconvert, as you can see on the right-hand side there, that the Western blot profile remains negative. This person, when we look using very, very uh, sensitive assays known as tetramastadine that identify HIV-specific CD8 T cells, we are not able to detect any HIV-specific CD8 T cell responses in this particular individual, suggesting that this particular individual over time does not make any HIV-specific CD8 T cell immune response. However, there are some early treated participants This is an individual we identified during CD stage 5. This particular individual zero convert. And despite the fact that when you introduce them on antiretroviral therapy, they completely the suppress viremia, this person is also able to make HIV specific immune responses. And we can detect this by tetramastaining. And we can detect these responses over time up to one year uh, post the infection. So again, one of the uh, important questions that we are interested in answering in this particular cohort is whether these individuals make immune responses and what are the quality of immune responses. One of the uh, one of the observations from this study is that in the untreated individuals, the individuals make HIV-specific immune responses, as you can see here, but these immune responses uh, are very weak in terms of producing key inter, uh, uh, antiviral uh, cytokines such as interferon, uh, interferon uh, uh, gamma. As shown here, when you compare HIV-specific CD8 T cells compared to CMV-specific CD8 T cells in the same individuals, you can see that the level of production of interferon gamma is very, very low for HIV-specific uh, CD8 T cells compared to uh, in this specific CD8 T cells. This uh, HIV specific uh, CD8 T cells also show uh, defects in markers of long term memory. And here I'm just showing you data, sh just looking at one particular marker of long term memory. Uh, so this is the expression of CD127 on HIV specific CD8 T cells. And once again, you can see that the HIV specific CD8 T cells. Uh, express very low levels of this particular molecule, suggesting that in HIV infection, there is a, a defect in making uh, memory CD8 T cells co when compared to CMV specific or EBV specific or even flu specific uh, CD8 T cells within the same individual. Okay, in the next slide, I show you what happens when we now treat uh, HIV infection during the active stage. So in the treated individuals, the individuals are now able to make, uh, not only are they able to make HIV-specific uh, immune responses, but in the treated individuals, these uh, CD8 T cells are also able to make antiviral cytokines, such as interferon gamma, much more when, when compared to the untreated individuals. So on the top panel is uh, HIV-specific immune responses, and you can see that there is healthy production of interferon gamma, whereas in the untreated individuals on the lower panel, the number of uh, HIV-specific uh, CDT that make interferon gamma are much lower, suggesting that uh, by treating these individuals, we might be able to preserve some functional activity of HIV-specific uh, CDT cells. So, in general, the frequency of single tetrama positive CD8 T cells is lower in the treated individuals. However, the function of these CD8 T cells seems to be much more improved in treated individuals. So, even though the overall frequency of HIV specific CD8 T cells is lower in the treated individuals, it seems that by treating these uh, individuals during, during the acute phase of infection, you can preserve some of the CD T cell functions that might be important 
for control of Vilinia and for maintaining a low uh, viral reservoir in, in this particular individual. All right, and finally, the other issue that we have examined in these individuals is the reservoir in terms of where the virus is hiding. And I'm showing you some immunohistochemistry uh, graphics where we have looked at the presence of P24 as a marker of HIV uh, replication within the late node tissue from some of the individuals that we have been able to uh, obtain the late node from. So BCL6 is a marker that we have used to stain for the presence of self follicles. And you can, as you can see in this graphic, we are able to identify this B cell follicle where we think that HIV might be hiding. And by P24 staining, we can also show that there is a high amount of P24 staining within this B cell follicle compared to areas outside of the B cell follicle. So we think that even in people who are HIV suppressed in the peripheral blood, in these individuals, there might still be HIV replication that is taking place within the B cell follicle in the late node, whereas outside the B cell follicle in the late node, we don't find any evidence of HIV replication, at least by a P24 staining. And this is, this is uh, something that we find both in the untreated individuals, but also in treated individuals. And in this slide now, I'm showing you that we can still stain for P24 even in early treated fully suppressed individuals. So this is an individual that is fully suppressed in terms of viremia in peripheral blood. But interestingly enough, in the lymph node, we can still detect P24, suggesting that uh, this might be a reservoir of HIV, where HIV is hiding within the B cell follicles, despite the fact that this person has a full suppression of viremia in peripheral blood. And some of our continuing studies are now looking at what are the mechanisms that allow the virus to continue to replicate within this B cell follicle, whereas we don't have any HIV replication outside of the B cell follicle. And uh, that is an area of uh, active uh, investigation in the laboratory at the moment. So in conclusion, we have demonstrated the feasibility of doing a QR research in a resource limited setting. We think that the fresh participants initiated on antiretroviral therapy during the hyperacute HIV infection phase may offer new insights on mechanisms of long-term viral remission. And we think that the understanding of the immune responses and reservoirs following combination antiretroviral therapy initiation may be used for future intervention studies. And we think that this cohort provides an ideal pr platform future interventions in the HIV uh, cure so that even if antiretroviral drugs by themselves are not able to cure, this particular group of individuals who could have a very, very low viral reservoir might be a good uh, platform for us to do other interventions such as vaccination or the use of broadly neutralizing monoclonal antibodies to see whether we can achieve long-term viral remission. And finally, I would just like to thank my colleagues uh, in particular, uh, Krista Dong and Ember Moodley, who are responsible for this particular cohort. Zazan Lobu and Jennifer Maroa, you know, group have done most of the immunological studies. I'd like to thank the participants. And uh, we collaborate uh, extensively with uh, Bruce Walker at the uh, Harvard Massachusetts General Hospital. And we have received funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, as well as uh, International Youth Vaccine Initiative as well as some of other funders to be able to conduct this study. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for that very, very interesting talk, uh, Dr. Ndungu. Um, so now what I'm going to do is open up the world for questions, not just the floor. Um, and I invite each of you who has a question to do this on the chat line, and then uh, we can ask uh, Dr. Ndungu these questions live, and he'll be able to respond. So maybe what I will do is I can um, start the questioning. Again, this was a very interesting talk, and it's quite exciting to see that this uh, 
first cohort is going to be able to provide some really exciting data. Thank you for giving us some uh, a preview of what's going on. Um, I noticed that you mentioned that you were looking at uh, an interferon gamma response. And, um, I have a, a, an incredible bias towards um, the innate immune response and very specifically a type 1 interferon alpha beta response. And I wondered whether you see um, changes in uh, that specific response that would predetermine um, in your untreated patients sort of the level of um, HIV. So have you looked at all um, in the PBMCs for uh, interferon alpha or beta levels or any sort of uh, type 1 interferon gene signature? Uh, Eleanor, I'm having some difficulties uh, actually understanding you because the line is breaking up. But uh, if I, I got you correctly, you are asking about uh, whether we have looked at interferon, type 1 interferon responses uh, in the in this participant. Correct. Uh, those studies are currently, currently ongoing, particularly for the uh, treated uh, participants to try and compare them uh, to the uh, to the untreated participants, but we do have some preliminary data from the untreated participants. And one of the interesting findings from our cohort is that, in fact, we don't see a significant increase in type one interferons following HIV infection, as has been described in previous other studies. And we are not quite sure why this is the case. In fact, um, as you all know, um, it, is, it has been described that during acute HIV infection, people experience what is known as a cytokine storm, with a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokines going up very high during the acute phase of infection. In the untreated participants, in our cohort, despite the fact that we have pre-infection samples and post-infection samples, so we can we can basically assay for these cytokines in the same individual before they became infected and after they became infected. We don't see a significant increase in most of the pro-inflammatory cytokines, which is uh, quite interesting. We don't know why this is the case, whether this is because um, maybe these individuals have a higher level of baseline uh, uh, inflammatory conditions, we are not uh, exactly sure. But this is something that we would really like to uh, investigate further. Thank you. Um, in the absence of another question, um, I'm going to ask you something else as well. Can you hear me? OK. Um, so what, it, what do you think Speaking of the impact? OK. Um, so my question to you would be, what are the implications, just in the absence of having um, accumulated data to date, can you speculate on, on this B cell follicle reservoir of virus? Can you hear me? OK. Yeah, OK. Let's uh, I can't. I can't hear you, uh, Eleanor. I'm gonna answer some of the questions that I can see online. Perfect. <laughs> I'm not, unfortunately, I can't hear your question, but I will answer. Um, so there, there is one question here that asks. You say that most of the early treated participants do not seroconvert. Do you think antibodies are important in controlling HIV? And if so. Would this not be detrimental for the early treated participant? Um, so this is an excellent uh, question. Uh, and it is true that some of the participants that are treated during the CBIC stage one of the infection do not uh, convert. We don't think that by these individuals not developing antibodies that we are somehow compromising their immune system. And the reason we don't think that is because in most uh, studies of chronic uh, HIV infection, particularly acute HIV infection, antibodies have not really been shown to 
play an important role in controlling viremia, certainly not during the early stages before broadly neutralizing antibodies develop. And as you know, broadly neutralizing antibodies develop after about uh, three years of infection. Having said that, I think what we had to do here was weigh the benefits of should we induce an immune response, which might potentially be beneficial to these participants, but we know that it does not durably control HIV infection, or should we treat these individuals immediately, and we know that treatment works in terms of controlling viremia. So we chose to go with the, with the latter, which is treat these individuals. But because we do see heterogeneity of immune responses between those who make responses and those who don't make responses, we think that we can actually get or address the question of whether those who make responses versus those who don't make responses, who actually ends up doing bet better in the long term. So that is something that we will be uh, exploring in this particular cohort uh, over time. And then there is a question here what, about what is your, your treatment regimen. And our treatment regimen is a standard three drug regimen that is used in South Africa. But uh, about a year ago, we also, in addition to the standard three drug regimen, we are adding rotegravir. So we are using four drugs now, whereas for the first uh, 11 participants that we treated, we just used the, three, the standard three drug regimen that we use for the treatment of uh, HIV infection in South Africa. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ndego, Ndungu. Um, it's uh, been a pleasure to, to hear your talk, and um, certainly I, I've learned a lot. <laughs> um, so now. I